I'm very pleased that I was born into the nation, the United States of America, the state I was in, and to the parents that I was born to. That does not mean that they were flawless, did not need to grow. My father wasn't even a Christian when I was born and would not be for 10 years later. But they had what most families had that were responsible families of that day and time. And what was really a part of our culture. And that was a sense of propriety. A sense of earning your own way. A sense of responsibility. And in all of that, there was a sense of how you appear before other people. We might call it, though it's foreign to many people today, uh, dressing for the occasion. Nowadays, uh, you have to explain to people what you mean by that to a great extent. But nevertheless, my mother was a stickler when it came to dressing for the occasion. And she would not let us come to the worship or some other place except that we dressed a certain way befitting the occasion. And I was trained that way. I was brought up that way. Now, also in my lifetime, everything that really has blown the United States out of the water also started. When it comes to morals, when it comes to ethics, when it comes to the decline in good things as the Bible defines good things. Because when I was young, we had the rebellious thing come along about the mid-60s. You had the hippies and the yippies and all kinds of mess like that. And when I was 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, I opposed them as much then as I do at 72. Now, that general disposition of rebelliousness. I think history is going to record that that was a turning point, mid-60s, thereabouts, in this country because of the embracing of subjectivism and relativism and I don't have to do what you tell me to and lack of respect for government and authority in general and in impacted religious matters. Paul wrote in Romans 3.18 that there is no fear of God before their eyes. We are there now. And like it is not, it affects your family. It, infect, it, it impacts especially the younger families, as to how you're going to rear those children. And it's going to impact how you cause them to understand there are occasions whereby you present yourself in a way that you don't at other occasions. So what I'm saying about all of this is, and I'll, I'll borrow the late Robert H. Bork's 1996 book title, when he said that uh, America was slouching towards Gomorrah. You haven't got that book. It's over 20 years old. You ought to read it in books like it. And what I have feared greatly and what I've seen virtually all the years I've been preaching from the time I stated a moment ago is that the church has done a lot of slouching toward something, and it hasn't been good. Those of us who are old enough to remember the last 50 to 60 years or longer know that's the case in personal experience. And it's, if you go among the denominations, even they have a general disposition of so what? The ideas of the hippies, let it all hang out, that kind of has permeated society. People don't, as I say, have a view toward occasions to be one way or the other. But especially a religious assembly convened before God Almighty on a special assembly to worship God. People don't think much about what goes on there. The reverence and godly fear that ought to be exhibited there in our conduct and the way we appear. So you, we usually apply this to false doctrine, but it's also true of the general appearance and conduct and attitude in our families, in the church, and so on. There is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So, 
what I am saying simply is that outward action reveals inward attitudes. I am affirming that there is a direct correlation between disrespect for and rebellion against God and his authoritative word and the slouchy language, conduct, and clothing all too often observed among those who wear the name of Christ and don't even get the implication of what that means. And as far as this study is concerned, we emphasize the slouchy clothing worn by many because they want to have some sort of comfortable whatever. And if you'll notice, most of this also, it comes out of this last 50 or 60 years too. It's all about me, 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 no matter what it does to you, you, you. Satisfy me, 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 or I'll bonk you, you, you on the head. And you see that now domineering in this country in all sorts of ways from the government right on down to the home. When you look at what was taught in the scriptures, it should cause us to recognize what it is to come before God to worship him. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will ye not tremble in my presence? Jeremiah 5.22. That means nothing to us, does it? The psalmist wrote, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. Psalm 89.7. That same inspired sentiment is expressed in the New Testament of the Christ. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 28 and 39. You get the idea that somebody just says, How are you doing, God? Well, I remember what a, what a stir it was in the 60s when somebody began to pray in a certain place and said, Hello, Daddy. Now, you really think that fits the term reverence and godly fear? Now, in consulting the original words translated fear, we see that they mean tremble, to hold in reverence, to stand in awe, and the like. Proverbs 4.23 informs us that the issues of life flow from the heart. And again, in Proverbs 23.7, we are taught that as we think in our hearts, so are we. Thus, our actions, our words, and our clothing especially as we're linking this up with the worship assemblies, especially the worship assemblies then flow from our hearts. What you're doing right now flows from your heart. As man thinking that his heart so is he. We see the foregoing set out in Proverbs 7.10. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. Now, that meant there was a way that a harlot that immoral woman, dressed to say, I'm an harlot. Of course, a lot of this has to do with the general teaching of the Bible on biblical modesty anyway, but that's not what I'm zeroing in on. Clothing, when and how it's worn, expresses a person's values and speaks volumes about our respect or disrespect for God, ourselves, and others. Why did the hippies start growing long hair? Did you ever ask that question? It was a flag of rebellion. That's all it was. It was to say we're not going to abide by authority, government or otherwise. If a custom involves clothing or conduct that sends the wrong message to others about ourselves, Paul taught us not to do it. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 16, and I don't know how many people have given serious study to that part of the Bible. It'll judge you someday. We have the record of certain women who were in violation of certain customs of those people. These women were not wearing their veils in public. To the non-Christian or of, of Corinth, their, their failure, notice the non-Christian, their failure to abide by that custom sent the wrong message to all who saw them unveiled. In the culture at Corinth, it meant that they did not respect the headship of their husbands. Paul wrote of such women saying that they might as well have had their head shaved, verses 5 and 6. But women in Corinth who had their head shaved were prostitutes. So what does Paul actually say? 
Thus we learn that wherein customs of people are not sinful in themselves. Listen. Christians are to respect and abide by them, lest in violating them they send a sinful message to those who see them and are ignorant of the gospel of Christ. As the late Roy C. Deaver in effect said, if red purses were commonly accepted in our culture as advertisement that a woman is a prostitute, then I would preach against Christian women carrying red purses. That's the application of that principle so it can be applied for time immemorial to whatever may come up in the minds of people that's right or wrong who don't know the Bible. Thus, the Christian must be mindful of how he presents himself to others, not only his brethren, but those who are not. And for that matter, how mom and daddy dress and act before their kids. Let's take an example of Moses from the Old Testament, knowing those things were written before time for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope, Romans 15, 4. And let's consider Moses at the burning bush, Exodus 3, 5. Verses 4 through 6 read, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standeth is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses said, how do, Daddy? And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, that's in your Bible. Does it teach you anything in serving Christ? Paul teaches us the importance of the Old Testament in such passages as I quoted a moment ago, Romans 15, 4. And from Paul's instruction, we have to ask, does this passage, Exodus 3, 4 through 6, teach us anything about our conduct and about our appearance when we come into the presence of the Lord. Can anyone conceive of Moses responding to God at that time with this remark? Well, I don't see any reason for me removing my sandals. After all, it's all about one's disposition of heart. It doesn't make any difference what I have on my feet or not. Now, knowing what we know, in general, of the Old Testament and God dealing with the children of Israel, what do you think would happen to Moses if he had done that? It would not have set well with him, but that's the reasoning some of my brethren use and think they are thinking like the Bible. Then there's Israel at Mount Sinai where God gave the law of Moses to the children of Israel. At the foot of Mount Sinai, God instructed Israel how to get ready for his appearance to them. In Exodus 19, 9 through 11, the scripture reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people, now listen to him, and sanctify them today and tomorrow. And let them wash their clothes, and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Now are we unable to see from the account just read that this was a very special occasion. And God expected Israel to show it in the way they presented themselves to God. Now what if the Israelites had responded to God with the remarks such as the following? Well, all that's necessary on our part for us to worship God is for us to do it in spirit and truth. There's nothing spiritually gained or lost by what we wear in coming before God. Why, we're before Him every day in all kinds of clothing, and He's no problem with our attire then. Besides, it's difficult here in the wilderness to find water to wash our clothes. Furthermore, we only washed our clothes a couple of days ago. Now, why wash them again? You don't think people think that way? then you haven't lived a life long. I doubt we can imagine God accepting such flippancy and disdain for him by any of the Israelites because of how he dealt with them when they did act in such a way 
as to blaspheme him in disobedience to his will. Remember, out of all those umpteen thousands that came out of Egypt, all of them died 20 years old and upward, except Caleb and Joshua, because of their sins against God. Then we come down to the priestly garments of the Levitical priesthood. Under the Mosaic economy, now remember, that's the schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, Galatians 3.27. We have a description of the special clothing of God's high priest, Exodus chapter 39 and Leviticus chapter 16. And he was a type of Christ, Hebrews 9 and 10. Thus, in typifying Christ, special and elaborate clothing was worn by the high priest. Also, all the priests had clothing that was special to their office. And the priests of the Old Testament economy represent members of the church. Now, the first articles of clothing for the high priest and the other priest was white linen undergarments, reaching from the waist down to the thigh, Exodus 28, 42, exposing one's nakedness in the worship of God had earlier been prohibited, Exodus 20 and 26, with these later inspired directives, it was then reinforced, Exodus 28:43a. Thus, in wearing their God-ordained undergarments, they remained modest as they performed their priestly duties. Do you think they had to be concerned about how they appeared before God in the Mosaic economy? In the time of the temple when the priest ascended steps that led up to the altars, this was especially the case, Leviticus 9.22 and Ezekiel 43.17. This clothing was for the protection lest they inadvertently break God's will in revealing their nakedness as they performed their duties before God. Now these men were the spiritual leaders of fleshly Israel. If they did not conduct and dress properly before God, then what message would be sent to the people of Israel? Further, if clothing does not matter, why did God have so much to say about it when it came to the priests of Israel? Again, written before time for our learning. What do you learn? Levitical priests were types of Christians, as I said. John wrote of Christians and has made us unto our God, kings and priests, the American standard says a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on earth, Revelation 5, 10. You might also see Peter's use of that in 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9. The priests were to present themselves before God with a general disposition of fear and awe for him and clothing that, perfitted, that befitted their work, Romans 15, 4, 1 Corinthians 10, 6 and 11 indicating again that they teach us how to serve God and worship Him under the New Testament authority. Concerning God's execution of Nadab and Abihu, priests who took lightly their service before God and sinned thereby, here's what Moses said to those boys, Father Aaron, the high priest. This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. Leviticus 10.3. And he killed two nonchalant priests and told the Father, don't shed a tear over it, because this is the thing God did. God has a way of making his points where you can't miss them if you're willing to listen. Now, do these accounts teach us anything about our dress and decorum when we come before God to worship him? In 2 Samuel 6 and 1 Chronicles chapter 15, we have the accounts of King David moving the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David. It was when David, it was then that David made mistakes, and we're not going to go into all that, in the first effort because he was ignorant of the Bible, and so were the priests as to the transportation of the ark. And it caused the death of Uzzah. After consulting God's word, and you might say a great deal of heart searching, David successfully moved the Ark of the Covenant to the city of David. Now, it's interesting to note, at least it was to me, that to celebrate transporting the Ark of the Covenant, 
The Bible says David was clothed with a robe of fine linen. 1 Chronicles 15, 27. Now please keep in mind the previous truths that we've studied this morning concerning our communication to God, ourselves, and others as to what we wear. And we need to ask the question, well, what was David doing wearing what he wore? Notice this description. I think that will help us knowing why David wore what he wore in the transportation of the Ark of the Covenant. So central to fleshly Israel, we're spiritual Israel, to fleshly Israel's service to God. It's seen in his own description of the Ark of God whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. Second. Samuel 6, 2. Now, a question. Why did David wear this special clothing for the transportation of the ark? The first thing you'll notice is there was no commandment for him to wear it. Also, why does the Bible tell us about it? Well, it's not because David realized he and all Israel were coming into the presence of the Lord in a special occasion. Thus, out of the respect and reverence for God, the king presented himself before God in suitable clothing. Now, you can say, well, that doesn't have anything the world to do with us. Then you figure out what it does have to do with it. It's in your Bible. It's there for your information. How do Christians apply the truth of Romans 15, 4 to King David? A man after God's own heart, Acts 13, 22. When we come into the presence of God to worship him today. You see, under the New Testament system, we have a better, better, better situation than they ever did. But look what they did under a lesser situation. Is there a lesson there for us? Now let's look at the worship of Revelation chapter 4. The Apostle John, the great revelator, describes in vivid and sobering word pictures the scene in heaven when the Lord is worshipped and exalted. The words of inspiration are awe-inspiring, and they make the spirit to tremble in the holy presence of the great I Am. Now listen to the great inspired revelator write. And the four living creatures, having each one of them six wings, are full of eyes round about and within. And they have no rest day and night, saying, Holy, 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 the Lord God the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creature shall give glory and honor and thanks to him that sitteth on the throne, to him that liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders shall fall down before him that sitteth on the throne and shall worship him that liveth forever and ever and shall cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy art thou, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou didst create all things, and because of thy will they are and were created. That's the American Standard Version of Revelation chapter 4, 8 through 11. In God's specific instructions regarding modesty, People are taught how to communicate the quality of their hearts to others. And as I say, specifically dealing with modesty, much of this material would bear. 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10 and 1 Peter 1, 3. Further, our Lord taught this. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Matthew 12, 35. What is our Lord saying? Well, he's telling us that our outward conduct, including and especially our clothing, is a revelation of what we really are, how we really think, what our viewpoint of the occasion really is. And this is one reason for not wearing tattoos and body art characteristic of many heathens today. What kind of message do your actions, language, associates, and clothing communicate to others about who you really are, especially when you wear the name Christian of Christ 
a member of the family of God, and you come to assemble to worship the God of all glory. If coming before God in the worship assemblies of the saints is not a special spiritual occasion, you need to rethink some things. And how are you ever going to change things regarding your children and educate them properly if you don't teach them that? Well, one affirm that God expects his children to make the worship assembly a common thing? A come as you are, dress as you like, and act as you please pep rally for God. That's what people are doing nowadays. Does God want the worshipers to be laid back, casual crowd, manifesting no dignity in their dress and conduct? Did you get that from all those things written aforetime for our learning in your Old Testament? Whether in the Old or New Testaments, we do not see such an attitude. We do not see such language. Neither do we see such conduct toward God approved. Thus, since the convening of the church of the living God to worship God is a special occasion, then why not convey to God the quality of the heart that God seeks in us by the way we speak and act? And yes, by the way we dress. Surely such conduct is a part of how Christians are to behave themselves, as Paul said to Timothy, I said it's a part of it, in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15. And we're back to our old Colossians 3.17 again. There are those who will say, well, I just don't see the need of it. Well, There are a lot of folks that saw all the evidence Christ provided of the Son of God, and they still cried, crucify him. So you're in a kind of bad company if the evidence is available and you still can't see it. Maybe some people contend that dressing up by wearing a coat and a tie for worship, well, it's just too uncomfortable. But we don't think about that regarding what we wear on other occasions, especially if those few still believe they're dress-up occasions. Besides, have we forgotten that we're to sacrifice ourselves to be well-pleasing to God? Boy, that's a big sacrifice to wear a tie. Sort of reminds you of being crucified, doesn't it? Do the high priest's garments sound very comfortable to you? Go back and read all that stuff he had on. But God expected him to wear them in his service under the law. Was the cross of Christ uncomfortable to him as he died for you and for me? Our comfort is not the fundamental consideration when we come together to worship God or when we leave the assembly to live faithful lives from day to day. How could you have more comfort than you've got in this auditorium? You see, we've let the world impact us. And if it's just not convenient, if it just doesn't tickle, tickle, tickle me, then I'll bow up like some old mad whatever at you. We learn from Malachi that the Jews of his day had reached such a low point in their love for and faith in God that they counted their service, to use his terms, a burden. There are those church members today who have reached the same state of mind in their lack of respect for God and the things of God. After all, about all they think of being a Christian is to come to a service on Sunday, get your ticket punched, then go back and live like everybody else. Their service to and worship of God has become a weariness to them. And among those things, their clothing reveals it. Some may say dressing up is too expensive. But listen. When you think of what people spend on vacations and cars and houses and anything else they want to do, I think God getting the leftovers and only the crumbs that fell from the leftovers with some people that they expect to hear from him, well done, good and faithful servant someday. They need to do so honest thinking a lot of the truth. Many people will spend all sorts of money on designer jeans and convenient clothing and footwear and sportwear cars and the like. Of course, some of us are not averse to visiting Goodwill stores in order to save money on clothing. And I hear brethren all the time bragging what a good deal they got online or what they found at a garage sale. What a low price. 
Well, if you want to find good clothes thrown away by silly people at good cheap prices, go to the Woodland Garage Sales. They do it all the time because they dress for each season. You can get good stuff up there. In those areas, we usually do what we want to do, and it's the same regarding what we have to wear to worship. Anything else, just excuses we make because our heart's not right with God. Of course, if there are people who are too poor to provide dress clothes for themselves, and none of their brethren have the finances to help them with such clothing. Then we'll just say they've got to do the best they can. And you can tell most people in this room are poverty stricken. I remember some of the old men back when I was a young boy, especially when I first started preaching. It was a very country congregation where I started. And they'd have their Sunday go to meeting in bib overalls with a white shirt and tie. But they... They wore that because they didn't wear it every day. It was the best they had. Now listen, here's the point being made. If you don't get it, you don't want to get it. The point being made is that they did the best they could in wearing the best they had. That's the point. And that's the point made in the Old Testament concerning God's people showing their fear, awe, and respect of God when they came before him. And we're under a better situation they ever had in the New Testament system. So what about people who come to worship in their work clothes because they don't have time to go home, change clothes, and get to worship on time? Well, I think that's great. That's an exceptional situation. That's wonderful. But even then there can be special provisions made knowing on that time that you're going to be there. Special provisions made. Isn't that a strange thing? Why do you have an insurance policy? Special provisions made. They should come if at all possible. That's the point. So we're not talking about exceptions. Did you get that? We're talking about the rule, just like today, and how we present ourselves. The people we are addressing are like the nine lepers found in Luke's account of Jesus when he healed them, chapter 17, verse 11 through 19. You'll remember that having cleansed the lepers, only one of them, just one of them, returned to thank the Lord for being healed. Remember what the Lord asked? Where are the nine? Now take note. Let this sink in. The Lord did not express to them in any way that they ought to thank him for their miraculous healing. But it's quite clear from the scriptures that Jesus thought all ten of them should have been deeply appreciative for what he had done for them. Paul tells us that one of the marks of a person who leaves God is a lack of thankfulness, Romans 1.21. Now, God is not given direct <coughs> and explicit statements saying that church members must dress a specific item of clothing when they come before him to worship. I know that. However, with all other things being scripturally equal, and in view of what the entire Bible teaches about how we are to show a respectful attitude of reverence toward God when we assemble before him to worship him, then he has a right to expect those who wear his son's name to respect him by their conduct, language, and clothing. Just like he expected all ten of the lepers to say thank you, though he did not say, please thank me. There are some things you assume go on in the mind of the one that bears the name Christian who has been redeemed from sins and are a member of the heaven-bound body of Christ. Now in other countries and other cultures, the people will wear what they have that fits the occasion I have worshipped with the saints in Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Israel, the UK, Russia, and Pakistan. Now some of these countries have some very, very poor people in them and thus poor brethren economically. Moreover, what dressing up is to some of them is not exactly the same as it is for others in their different cultures and societies. And this is the case because they have those different customs in their cultures, in their 
what they call their dress clothing. However, for the most part, when they came together, they wore the clothing that was considered the best they had as they assembled before God in worship. We know the kind of clothing most of us wear to a funeral, especially if it's a family member or a friend, and you know that person doesn't know what we have on. They'll never be able to say, you look so nice at my funeral. Regarding our dress for a funeral, we do it knowing that the dead person's not present. But we groom and dress ourselves. Isn't that amazing? You can get a haircut. To show our respect, for the family and the dead family member, to the friend, and all gathered in memory of the deceased. We also dress up for weddings or job interviews or like special occasions. We even have certain clothing we'll wear if we go hunting, and we'll spend lots of money on that. Or we have certain work clothes we'll wear to do certain jobs. We recognize that. What about the children of the living God? The church of the Lord. The blood purchased institution. How do we demonstrate to the world and to ourselves our awe and reverence and respect for God, especially in a special assembly, which this one is, whereby we are to engage in acts of worship before the living God? If we can understand all that I said here, why can we not see how important it is then to present ourselves the best way we can and to train our children to do so? when we come before God. If we seldom or never teach about respect for God and how the values of the heart are manifested to God, ourselves, and to the brethren, then we can only expect the same to continue to diminish in importance as it has the last 50 years in our society in general. Church members begin to believe that nothing they do or how they appear is disrespectful to God or man, and they'll fight you over it. Gradually and incrementally, a congregation's respect for God and spiritual things change for the worse. Look at the nation. Sadly, this is where we are in the church today in, in our society, in every facet of it, from the home to the government, the schools, etc. The fact that we assemble in the presence of an omnipotent, omniscient, holy, eternal, and majestic God is almost forgotten. Personal convenience, extreme casualness, even to the point of being slouchy in our dress has become more important to us than respect for God and all of that implies and manifesting the same in our conduct, words, and clothing. Brethren, we must remember the teaching of the inspired Apostle Paul in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therein the Apostle wrote, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Key is the renewing of your mind. The psalmist penned, the Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him. Psalm 147, 11. The writer of Proverbs wrote, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Chapter 1, verse 7. The foregoing being the case, then we must make sure we are not fools when it comes to what we wear, say, and do in our daily lives, but more especially on these special occasions of coming before the God of all the universe to worship Him as the Bible instructs in His family, the church of the living God, the kingdom of heaven made up of citizens who want to please Him more than anything else on this earth. We are to provoke one another into love and good works. We are to remind one another of what it is to be a godly pattern of life for others to look at, even in the worship. And how are you going to train your children to be what they ought to be when they can look at later on and say, well, Daddy doesn't do that. And if they haven't done that yet, they will. Our Mama does this. 
Yep, there's a whole lot involved in this. And so much of it's going to have to do with whether heaven will be our home. Because it has to do with how we show our love and respect and obedience to God. And how we think by our actions is very obvious in some cases. If you're not a child of God this morning, we urge you with all your heart to believe that Christ Jesus is the Son of God. Repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess your faith in Him and be buried with your Lord in baptism by His authority to obtain the remission of sins and be a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A member of the church of which you read in your own New Testament. To glorify Him according to His will. And as a child of God, if you have wondered, if your disposition of heart has not been, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, command and I will obey. For I want to set the example before the world of godliness. And you need to think about that because we're not assured of even coming back this afternoon. Death may take us at any time. Be prepared. The Bible teaches as much as it teaches anything. Be prepared to leave this world. And when you do, to know that heaven's going to be your home. That comes by loving God with all your heart, all that you have and are, loving your neighbors yourself. And if you love me, Jesus said, you will keep my commandments. So if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, I invite you to come while we stand and sing.